Um, let's just uh, get started. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of ironic how we're in 2020 and speaking about vision, but today we have to speak about the blindness or the lack of a vision. Um, and um, the Lord healed many people, um, and he also healed many um, people who were blind, as we read in the different passages of the gospel. And St. John, um, because he wrote his gospel last, he doesn't describe all of the miracles and all of the healings, but he narrows it down to just a few. Um, and uniquely enough, the church selects many of those healings to, for the passages, uh, especially in the Great Lent. So last week we read about, anyone remember? You can unmute yourselves when you answer a question. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Anyone? Lame. What's that? The lame man. Yes, the healing of the, the man who was paralyzed at the well of Bethesda. Very good. And today we see uh, another healing. Uh, so that was John chapter 5. Today is John chapter 9 of the man who was uh, born blind. And I think a lot of you already know um, the story, so we won't go into the detail, and hopefully you read it with, with um, your families already. Um, if not, it's, it, it's, it's quite lengthy, about the same length as the Samaritan woman, about 41 verses, um, but we see the healing part in the first half of the story, and then how he is interrogated <laughs> several times by several different people um, about what happened. And finally, he meets the Lord at the end again, and he, he believes and he worships um, and, he, and accepts Christ um, uh, fully. So this, uh, this is kind of like the pyramid that we've been showing you the last few weeks of how we're inching towards um, the, the passion and resurrection of, of the Lord. Um, <clears throat> so um, a lot of uh, the time, this gospel or the healing of the, the blind is a, a great symbol of the baptism. Um, again, we won't go into the details, but I'm just giving you a general introduction. Um, <clears throat> and um, I think the question that's uh, occupying a lot of our minds is similar to the question that the apostles asked the Lord in the very beginning of the gospel. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Um, or to equate it for today, um, uh, is the coronavirus here to punish us for our sins? <laughs> um, uh, is this another case of the flood where God is pouring out his wrath on mankind? Um, and even some other uh, churches or some theologians or even a misunderstanding of what some orthodox priests are saying uh, falls along this line. And so I thought it was a good an opportunity to correct the, the improper the theology because people start getting afraid and upset uh, and disappointed at God um, saying that, oh, this is because of our sins. Um, and of course, this is not another case of the, of the flood. Why? Because if you go to Genesis, uh, also chapter 9, um, uh, nine, 9 verse 11, um, or 911, um, <clears throat> it, God did, promised that he wouldn't uh, bring about wrath like the flood again. Um, and he said, never again will I cut off all flesh um, by the waters of the flood. Some people might say, oh, this is not a flood, this is something else. But it's, it's a testimony to the loving uh, kindness of God and his mercy, and that not all suffering is because of punishment. Um, how do we know this? Um, well, let's go to the fathers. Saint Gregory the Great, um, he's a, a Catholic saint, I believe in the sixth or seventh century, um, not one of ours because, as you know, after the, the split, we, we don't commemorate or recognize um, just for practical reasons, um, uh, the other saints and the other churches and vice versa. Um, but nevertheless, a lot of the writings are theologically true. Um, <clears throat> so St. Gregory the Great uh, exemplifies this when he says, um, why is there suffering in the world? Well, here he gives four different reasons. Um, the first one, one blows falls on the sinner for punishment. This is what the disciples are saying. What, is it because of his sin? Um, another occurs for correction. Um, 
So sometimes God allows difficulties in our lives to correct us, to wake, to wake us up. And the third reason is because maybe we haven't done anything yet, but we're going to. So he wants us also to wake up and to prevent us um, from kind of like the parent. You know, the parent might punish their child for making a mistake. Um, he might or she might stop them from doing something, um, punishing them before they make a mistake, um, or um, not allowing them to make a dis certain decision that will um, uh, cause them um, a lot of harm. Of course, I don't want to go into the theological implications, but I'm not talking about God limiting man's free will, but uh, allowing difficulties and tribulations and suffering um, to help to help us steer ourselves in the proper direction. The last one, which I think is probably the most appropriate and the most acceptable, here says another blow happens neither for correcting the past sins nor for preventing future sins. Rather, the unexpected deliverance following the blow serves to excite a love more focused on the Savior's goodness. So. Um, God sometimes allows difficulties so we can focus more on God's love. I know it sounds hard to accept, but this, this is the case even with the man here. Um, and when we go to uh, the fathers, <clears throat> also St. John Chrysostom, he says, um, <clears throat> he has a long um, explanation in, in, in his commentary, but he says, um, <clears throat> uh, the disciples asked the questions because with the paralyzed man, if you remember of, of last week, he, he tells him, sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. So Christ is indirectly saying, you're, you're of the first or the second type. Um, this uh, paralysis happened because you sinned. Um, and now that you're healed, don't do it again. Um, uh, but in this case, um, the Lord clarifies to his disciples, he didn't sin and his parents didn't sin. Um, <clears throat> uh, and um, then he gives the example, what about children or people who, are, who suffer from sickness or disease? He says very clearly, it's not because of their sins. Um, same thing, there's a lot of suffering that happens to Christians or non-Christians even in the world, and it's not because of their mistakes. Um, far be it, that means anyone who ever gets sick is, is, is because they're sin, the sinful. Um, it doesn't make sense. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> St. John Chrysostom also says, um, through his blindness, he recovered his sight. As then the, the evils of the present life um, are not evils, so neither are the good things good. Um, sin al alone is an evil, but blindness is not an evil. So he says even the, the difficulties or the evils of this life, include the coronavirus, whatever, um, are not evils. And they're neither, uh, so, and even some of the good things, like, I don't know, um, the rising of the uh, economy or whatever, that's not necessarily uh, good because we're good, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so um, all the people who are suffering from sickness or died from Cronus, for example, they're not sinners. Maybe some of them are, um, but it's not because necessarily um, that they did something wrong. What is evil, though, is our sin. And this is what we need to destroy. This is what we need the vaccine for. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay. So here, um, St. Cyril of Alexandria um, also has a very lengthy explanation on, on this verse. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of paraphrase um, for, for what he said here. He says, um, the, the silly question of, was it because of his parents? Um, he couldn't have sinned before he was born. He says, no one um, who, who's, who is not in the flesh um, can, can sin. Um, uh, and um, again, let's not talk about the devil and all of that. That's, that's a whole other theological discussion, which doesn't really pertain to us because we're all in the flesh. Um, but he says he, he couldn't have sinned before his, he was born. And um, his parents' sin has no implications upon God's wrath upon the son, right? As the Bible clearly states. 
but he kind of simplifies it here by saying, let's not try to understand things that are too deep for us. As the Psalm says, um, 131, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, neither do I concern myself with great matters or things too profound for me. So a lot of these deep questions we say, okay, let, let me not worry too much about things that are too complicated. Let me focus on my salvation and, and being right with God. That's the most important thing. <clears throat> and um, St. Cyril says, the Lord does not speak dogmatically when he says that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Um, meaning, he says, he's saying this, if you remember the, the previous slide of St. Gregory the Great, the fourth reason, he says it to direct the questioner in another direction and to lead us from far, things too deep for us to be more, to, to, too deep for us to more suitable uh, questions. Um, so that's what we always try to do when, when we have, the, um, even uh, St. Paul talks about this, when, when there's a lot of dialogues and discussions and debates, like, don't, don't trouble yourselves with a lot of these things. Focus on the things that pertain to your salvation. These are the more suitable ones. Okay, so what um, does um, the St. Augustine say about the good quarantine here? Um, he says, um, uh, of course God listens to sinners, but the man who said that had not yet the way washed the face of his heart in Siloam. Um, the sacrament had already taken place in his eyes, but the benefit of grace had not yet been achieved in his heart. I think this applies to a lot of us a lot of the time. Um, we have the sacraments, we have the grace of God, we have the blessing, but Still, our hearts are not in the same page sometimes, um, myself included, uh, and maybe even first. Um, and and this, is the, this is the problem. We're kind of like the blind man after he was healed, but before he truly believed in Christ. Um, uh, same thing with, with the paralyzed man. Um, same thing with the Samaritan woman. Who is he that I may believe in him? It is he who is speaking with you. Um, so St. Augustine says, when did the blind man wash the face of his heart? When after he had been thrown outside by the Jews, after he was cast out of the temple, if you look at the end of the story, the Lord brought him inside into himself. This is how Christ deals with the one who was cast off, like with the Samaritan woman or the adulterous woman, or anyone who feels far away. And that's why, um, if you remember when we pray in the Passion Week, we pray outside of the altar most of the time, out at the very back of the church, um, because Christ was crucified outside the gate. He... he uh, was condemned for our sake. And he was also went to the place of condemnation to return those who were maybe condemned by others, but not by God. Um, <clears throat> and this is the beauty of, of the good quarantine. Um, so we're, we're quarantined in our own homes, but Christ breaks all barriers. He goes to, to anyone who feels afar off and brings them near to him. This is the love of God. Um, <clears throat> not because they're sinners. Um, but because he wants them to be saints. Um, and St. Augustine continues, <clears throat> who, what is the real Siloam? Um, well, um, you know that the translation of the Siloam is what? Um, it means the, the one who is, or the sent. Um, uh, as St. Augustine explains here, let me just use <laughs> his words much better than mine. He says, you see, he found Christ, he found him and said to him, as we heard, do you believe in the Son of God? This is the end of the story. And he answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? He could already see him, certainly with his eyes, but with his heart, not yet. Um, so we see God with our eyes, or we see the icons, or we see the church, we see the altar, maybe not right now, but, um, but with our hearts, not yet. Um, wait for it. He will see it in the moment, he says. Uh, after all, Solomon was talking to him. So he, cries, he calls Christ Solomon. Why? Because he's the one sent. Do we have any verses? In, in, if you read the, the, the story of today in John 9, to, to show how Christ was sent, we know he's the only begotten son uh, sent from God the Father. Um, actually, the Lord uses uh, or characterizes himself as the one sent before he makes the miracle. Um, uh, because he says, um, uh, I do the will of my Father who sent me, right? 
So God the Father sent the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. Um, and that's why he sent the, the blind man to the pool who was sent. So he, in a sense here, uh, sorry for the play on words, but he's sending the blind man to Christ who was sent by God the Father. Um, everyone has a job and a mission. Um, and sometimes our mission is just to find the missionary, to find Christ. Um, so St. Augustine explains this more beautifully or powerfully when he says, so he himself, Christ himself, was still the one. Um, and this is why we keep it in the gospel. It, yes, there's a pool somewhere in, in Jerusalem um, wh where he physically went um, with the mud on his eyes, walking through the city. I'm sure it was uh, a sight for sore eyes. Um, uh, but he says here, the blind man in heart approached, heard, believed, worshipped, washed his face, and saw. Um, so this is a kind of, just like he went through very many different steps to finally find Christ, we do the same. <clears throat> He's coming to you. He, he was sent for you. He was sent for me. He was sent for all of us. Let us approach him. Let us hear him. Let us believe him. Let us worship him. Let us wash our faces and our hands and our whole bodies in the pool of baptism. Um, and let us see. Um, say, I want to see you, Lord, in my life. I want to be blinder to everything else and to see you more clearly. Um, we need to adjust our focus. Um, all of us, um, myself first and foremost. Um, it's, you know, like when you see in a camera, whatever you focus on, everything else becomes a little bit more blurry or even a lot more blurry. So many of us might be focusing on the problems, focusing on coronavirus, focusing on um, my issues, focusing on uh, work or, and then God is in the background, he's blurry. But in this case, God is saying, no, focus on me and everything else will become more clear. What is more important will become more clear. What is less important will fade in the background. Um, this is the, the wisdom of those who focus on Christ. Um, also, St. Augustine uh, says, um, uh, I think I skipped the slide. Sorry. Yeah, St. John Chrysostom says, but I assert that he even received benefit from his blindness because he recovered the sight of the eyes from within. Um, so look at the reason for all this. Look at the end. The man was able to see from the outside and from the inside. How many people can say that I see everything clearly now? Um, the only way to see everything clearly is to see Christ first clearly. Um, and even if you asked him, um, would you have been willing to suffer temporary blindness to be able to see cl things more clearly now? Um, of course. Would you be, uh, what about you? What about me? Would I be willing to s suffer something temporarily so that I could see everything more clearly later? I hope so. Maybe this quarantine is, is, is uh, the benefit, the benefit of this, the corona. Uh, one of the fathers uh, has a whole series of talks call, called the benefits of corona. <laughs> um, it, so the question is, would you be able or willing to suffer temporarily um, uh, or suffer, let's say, recovery time after an operation so that you could be healthier than you w were before or the, all of your life before that? Of course. Um, would you be willing to taste bitter medicine now so that you could be healthier in the future? Um, so these are the benefits of, of, of the suffering that or what we should take from the, the tribulation and the suffering. Um, <clears throat> so St. Augustine also says, see how he, the blind man, became a herald of grace. See how he preaches the gospel. The same thing with the Samaritan woman or every Christian who truly has an impact by being with the Lord. See how he wants... Once he is endowed with sight, he becomes a witness. Um, and this is St. John in his gospel, especially with the, those seven healings. Once there is um, a transformative interaction with God, they become a witness to the world. Um, many people might not see it at their time, um, 
but God uses um, all of those powerful um, life stories to transform our lives um, and the lives of others. He says, the blind, that blind mind testified and the ungodly were troubled in their hearts because they did not have in their hearts what they saw in him. So people looked at the blind man and said, oh, he is changed not only from the outside, but also from the inside. And I don't have that yet. So they were troubled in their hearts. It's okay to be troubled a little bit, as long as you don't accuse or judge others, but you say, I want this for myself as well. Um, God transform me inside as well. Let me see on the inside as well as that. Okay. Um, a couple more, I think this is the last slide here. Um, St. Ephraim the Syrian says, uh, when our Lord opened up the eyes of one blind man clearly in that moment, he opened up the eyes of many blind people secretly. So when God opens my eyes in, in one moment, um, he can do uh, the same with others. Um, or just by reading and understanding the gospel of today, we ask God to open up our, our um, eyes of our hearts secretly. Uh, he says, that man was surely blind. He was like a source of profit for our Lord, for by him our Lord acquired many blind people, hopefully including us, by healing them from the blindness of their hearts. That's kind of the accusation that the Lord gives at the end of the gospel today. He was saying this man couldn't see, and now he sees, but there's a lot of people here that think they see, but their blindness remains. Hopefully that's not said of us. Um, but maybe the Lord can use our weakness and the healing of our weakness to also heal the blindness or the weakness of others. Um, uh, many people's um, lives, stories, whether in the scripture or in the lives of the saints or our acquaintances or relatives of ours that lived a holy life or, or still continue to live a holy life, they impact our relationship with God in a very positive way. And, and maybe even they help us to see things more clearly. Um, and we hope that we can also be a, a vessel or a tool that God can use to also open the eyes, not only of our own hearts, but of, of others. Um, may the Lord continue to open up the eyes of, of our hearts and the rest of the world. And glory be to him now and from to the age of ages. Amen.